I've been playing Luminous Arc because you have no time to game. Welcome to the next When the Credits Roll review, a series in which I only review a game once the credits have rolled. So you have some faith that I may know what I'm actually talking about. Luminous Arc was released on Feb 8th, 2007 in Japan, August the 14th, 2007 in North America, and October the 19th of the same year in the EU, and was developed by Image Epoch and published by Marvelous Interactive in Japan. At, published by Atlas in North America and Rising Star Games in the EU for the Nintendo DS, and it took me roughly 25 hours to complete. So what the heck is a Luminous Arc? Well, it's a classic example of a tactical role-playing game that feels very much like the other Image Epoch games. It has many of the things that define them, from the very anime in tone, a kind of a bland main character, but I don't mean that in a negative way, which is weird to say. Um, this character gets surrounded by a large female cast, and some males as well. Has some interesting voice acting, but this is actually the first game from Energy Epoch, so it's more the game that defined all of these traits going forward. And interestingly, it's kind of similar to their very last game, as Image Epoch sadly no longer exists as a company. And, well, Luminous Arc is a medieval fantasy-style adventure, strategy, tactics, RPG, with a main character getting a lot of witches. And their last game, Stellar Glow, is pretty much the same. <laughs> a very different story, but medieval fantasy... Main character gets surrounded by lots of witches and is a tactics game. <laughs> so yes, um, they started and left the same way. Anyway, the story. In a medieval era where everyone is ruled over by the Luminous Church, a benevolent force of order and good that worship the gods as he hail. A young renowned knight called Heath has been tasked with training a group of even younger would-be knights called the Garden Children. The kind of leader of is Alf, and Alf is actually our main character. The purpose of the Garden Children is to hunt down and kill the one force in the world that is opposed to the loving church, the witches. And well, it's not long before stuff happens, and the Garden Children, led by Alf, soon learn that not everything is as it seems, and maybe the witches aren't as bad as they first appear, and maybe the church isn't quite as good as it first appears. Honestly, the story is some pretty basic anime JRPG nonsense. Church bad, kill God. But it's surprisingly not a harem game. Yes, you acquire a group of female characters in the form of the witches, and but Alf only has eyes for one of them. And one of them only has eyes for him. And some of the others actually kind of pair off as well. But in its simplicity, is hiding... Something that's actually quite fun and enjoyable, with an interesting and varied cast of characters, even if they do live up to various stereotypes. It does have the occasional plot twist as well. There's also a very odd underlying story that runs throughout the game called The Life of Coppin, and well, it's something that just needs to be experienced. So, gameplay. Once more, good friends, we descend into the abyss that is the tactical RPG, with all its grid based wonders. But first, as we always do, out of the battle, we have a node-based map. Surprise, surprise. What does this mean? It means that when we're on the world map, it's not a free-to-explore environment, a la something like Final Fantasy VII. Instead, you're presented with a series of nodes that you can select and move to. There are different kinds of nodes. The classic city node, which has a shop, generic location, that is usually there for story reasons, and all you can do is talk to your buddies and encounter nodes that have crossed swords and are not so random encounters. <laughs> Basically, the first time you come across them, you have to battle. And then moving around the map, every time you step onto one of these encounter nodes, there's a chance you'll be forced into a battle or you'll be given the option to select the battle. So it's kind of random encounters. 
every time you step on it, whether you'll be forced into it or not. But yeah. As I've said, the non-encounter nodes, you have a couple of options. These are to talk to your buddies to get some extra story info or shop. And the shop is pretty standard fare. You buy, sell, and a mildly useful outfit section where you can equip your new items, save you having to go all the way back out of the menus to the world map to do equipment. Um, money in this game is pretty tight, unless you grind a lot. So when hitting a new shop, I find I did a lot of buying, equipping, selling to buy more items, rinse, repeat until you run out of money. And speaking of the equipment, every character has a unique weapon type, a couple of bits of armor they can equip, and a couple of accessories that you can have fun with as they have like different effects. Other than this, there's not really much to do outside of battle apart from then see the story scenes play out. Story scenes are mostly just text-based affairs, uh, visual novel style where you see one character appear on the screen talking and then another appear. But there is some voice acting. Um, and then after a certain point in the game, you actually unlock something new, which is imbuing items. Where to imbue items, you select between one of two characters that can imbue the items. These aren't party characters, they're specifically for this. And then you select a item. Um, you select two of these things called Vitae that you get from doing random battles and character interactions. These are kind of like emotions to add to the items. And it will either result in a new item or a failure. And it's very much trial and error. The characters do give you a bit of clues by certain things they say as to what might work. And each character has a different selection of what they produce and what they need to produce them. Um, but like I said, it's all very trial and error, unless you have a guide. <coughs> Game facts. <coughs> uh, but it's also a feature I actually didn't use. Like, I tried it once, and then didn't, didn't use it. Okay, on to the meat of the game, the battle system. The battle system is... a of the classic variety, working pretty much how you'd expect it. Um, this one is a speed-based turn order, a la Shining Force, and it works in that you have the option to do an action and a move. So it's no like action point system or anything like that. It's literally, you can move and do an action, one of each. Um, and you can do that in either order. You can do an action, then move, or move an action, but that's it. The actions are usual fare, uh, attack, weight, item, and then the characters have skills or magic. But those are, they work effectively the same way. They both cost MP, and it's just an indication of whether the character is a magical character or not. It, it could have been one menu. The big twist here is the flash drive system and synergy attacks. Each character has an FP meter that builds up to a max of three and it can be spent on flash drive attacks, which you each character can unlock three of, the each one then costing different amount of FP and doing more damage depending on how much FP they cost. So you, the first one you get always costs one, so you'd be able to do it three times if you have full FP, obviously over three turns. Um, the second one costs two FP and the last one costs three. It's very much kind of like, think of like your limit break, special attack, if we use Final Fantasy terms. Basically your big flashy special move. Synergy attacks also use the FP meter, but require you having an appropriate ally nearby. And everyone to have 3 FP. And it's basically a combined attack from those characters on that turn. And it's a big flashy move. You get these usually due to story reasons. Um, it's also got a classic side and back attacks, more effective, and it has its own elemental system. It does have like um, a picture in its tutorial menus that shows you the different elemental breakdowns. But honestly, I didn't really use it. I didn't really pay much attention to it. And it was fine. But I'm sure if you're like the min-maxers out there, would be able to exploit the game some way using this. Uh, Luminous Arc's XP system is the whoever does an attack or an action gets the XP. So when they do the action, meaning you can level up 
during your turn as opposed to having to wait till you've done a battle and then everyone gets XP. So killing enemies is better than just hurting them as you'll be getting more XP for doing that. If they're a greater level than you, you get even more XP. Uh, the interesting thing about here is buff and healing skills. When you use them and they affect at least one ally, you always get 30 XP from it. Uh, if it only affects yourself, you get five XP. But this means, as you only ever need 100 XP to level up, doing four buff skills from zero XP will take you to over 100, and you'll level. And when you level up, you get all your HP and MP back, meaning the most effective way to grind in this game is to go to one of the early low-level maps, kill all the enemies bar one, and then have all your characters just sat there casting buff spells on each other because they will never run out of MP because every four spells they set off or four skills they get all their MP back um, honestly though you don't really need to do much grinding in this game there was only one point where I felt I needed to actually stop and do some so my character levels were all over the place and they also didn't feel quite strong enough to do the next map this was like the biggest jump in difficulty in the game and then it really stayed. Once you got those levels, that was it. You were fine for the rest of the game. But yeah, the character sheet, you get to see at all times, um, in battle at least, as this is a DS, so it's dual screen. So the one screen is always showing the character sheet, which is quite useful. It's got all the basic stats you'd expect. Um, but you also have your AT number, which is your active turn number, which shows your position in the turn order, which is... So you can see at a glance when a character is going to take a turn. There's also a couple of little boxes that fill out when you get positive or negative effects. Meaning again, you can see them at a glance what positive and effects and negatives are affecting your character. Characters also have a class, but it's kind of pointless in a sense. Because you can't, there's no class system as such. There's no, like, any character class changes are completely story related nothing you can do there's no leveling up the classes i love like final fantasy tactics or tactics ogre uh, they just have a class it's just there it's kind of disappointing in a way it'd be cool to have had that element in uh, something else i want to talk about when i first started the game i was very frustrated by this basically the game has three three four control schemes that you can flick through at the touch of a button which i didn't realize for a while actually it defaults to a touch-based control scheme. And as I was playing it on the Steam Deck, this is kind of incredibly fiddly. <laughs> Basically, you can do little bits with the D-pad and the face buttons, but actually selecting options, selecting a tile to move to, and all that sort of stuff is done by the touch screen. In battle, this is. Outside of battle, you could use the D-pad. I don't know why... When they're doing a touchscreen system that a bunch of it then is not and it's all kind of all over the place what you had to do use the touchscreen for the second option so when you first when you click the change control scheme button it left hands it and all that does is swap the d-pad and the face buttons around so yeah the last option is just the d-pad and no use of the touch screens so you get to use the face buttons and the d-pad to do everything and no touchscreen. I don't know why there couldn't just be an option for both. I'm not a DS programmer. Maybe it was too complicated for them. I don't know. It's a bit weird. But anyway, I started to use this option because it felt more comfortable than using the touchpad and the touchscreen on the Steam Deck. That's really not designed for it. Uh, not designed in the sense that it's not designed for this game. But. The next headache hit, it has a separate option that's hidden away in the general menus and not on the button click that lets you change your control scheme. But outside of battle, on the world map, going into the option screen, you can change the D-pad's direction. Now, it defaults to what I believe it said was right. 
And that's kind of like the isometric control scheme, where when you press forward, it's actually going like up and to the left, not, not up. And it threw me. I have never been able to do it that way. It's difficult to explain, but you probably know it when you come across it. Um, and I'm sure you can get used to it after a while, but thankfully it had the option to change the direction. And I was able to play the game how I like it and how the control scheme works for my brain. But yeah, it almost gave me a mental breakdown trying to control the whole thing. Anyway, once you finish battles, you get to the intermission menu. It's a very rudimentary relationship system in which you get a small conversation with whatever your buddies you select on and their heart gauge slowly goes up. And once you reach certain points, they give you a cheeky item. It's not any sort of persona level social links or anything like that. It's a very simple rudimentary system. And the game also has network battles, but yeah, that, that ain't happening. Well, that's everything I can think of. So what was good about the game? The characters kind of really make the game, especially the witches. They may be a bit tropey, but they are fun. And fun is the goal after all. And I've always been a fan of speed-based turn orders, just the Shining Force fan in me. And with the variety of characters, skills and magics that you have, and the fact you can bring eight of them along with you into every battle, means you have quite an open battle system to do what you want with. Just a shame it's missing the uh, any sort of job system. And what sticks out as a negative? Well, in Luminous Arc's case, the story is very trope-ridden. It's very classically designed. It's got all the classics that everyone jokes about when they talk about JRPGs. and isn't particularly deep or philosophical to hide that away in any way. So, anyway, my th for my final thoughts, what do the critics think? Well, according to Metacritic, it gets a 70 from the critics and a 7.0 or a 70 from the users. And honestly, that feels about right. I know in modern days, 70 can be seen as quite a low score, where if you're basically not below, if you get below 90, you're not good, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Um, but a 7 in a reasonable 0 to 10 scale is good, solid game. And that's how I've always seen it. So yeah, Luminous Arc is a solid entry in the tactical genre, if lacking in innovation in its gameplay. It's basically your Saturday morning cartoon take on the genre. With all the stereotypes you'd expect, the heroes are good, the bad guys are evil, and with friends you can overcome everything, all wrapped up in like the genre's staple gameplay. So yeah, my rating is, give it a go.